Manhattan. I was brought up on, on the northern coast of, of Massachusetts, and my whole childhood was spent on the ocean. I remember the, the very spectacular hurricanes we used to have where my grandmother's cellar would be flooded and there would be sharks washed up in the garden and so forth. And the image of the sea has been with me ever since, even though I've, I've um, been inland for a few years. And I think one always goes back to, to something as vivid and colorful as this sort of experience. And I know that the sea comes into um, a great many of my poems. Sometimes it, it's just a, a subconscious sea, a sort of flow of thoughts and so on. Other times it's the real sea itself. Were you a happy child? Well, I think I was happy uh, up to the age of about nine, very carefree, and uh, I believed in magic, which, which uh, influenced me a good bit. And then at, at nine, I was rather disillusioned. I stopped believing in, in elves and Santa Claus and all these little beneficent powers and became more realistic and depressed, I think, and then gradually uh, became, became more adjusted about the age of 16 or 17. Ocean 1212W. When I was learning to creep, my mother set me down on the beach to see what I thought of it. I crawled straight for the coming wave and was just through the wall of green when she caught my heels. I often wonder what would have happened if I had managed to pierce that looking glass. Would my infant gills have taken over, the salt in my blood? For a time, I believed not in God, nor Santa Claus, but in mermaids. The road I knew curved into the waves with the ocean on one side, and my grandmother's house. To this day, I remember her phone number, Ocean 1212W. I would repeat it to the operator, an incantation of fine rhyme, half expecting the black earpiece to give me back like a conch, the susurrus of the sea out there, as well as my grandmother's hello. The disquieting muses. Mother, mother, what ill-bred aunt, or what disfigured and unsightly cousin did you so unwisely keep, unasked to my christening? that she sent these ladies in her stead with heads like darning eggs to nod and nod and nod at foot and head and at the left side of my crib. Mother, who made to order stories of Mixy Blackshort, the heroic bear. Mother, whose witches always, always got baked into gingerbread. I wonder whether you saw them, whether you said Words to rid me of those three ladies nodding by night around my bed, mouthless, eyeless, with pitched bald head. Day now, night now, at head, side, feet, they stand their vigil in gowns of stone, faces blank as the day I was born, their shadows long in the setting sun that never brightens or goes down. And this is the kingdom you bore me to, mother, mother. But no frown of mine will betray the company I keep. Lady Lazarus. I have done it again. One year in every ten I manage it. A sort of walking miracle my skin bright as a Nazi lampshade, my right foot a paperweight, my face a featureless fine Jew linen. The first time it happened, I was ten. It was an accident. The second time I meant to last it out and not come back at all. I rocked shut as a seashell. They had to call and call and pick the worms off me like sticky pearls. Dying is an art, like everything else. I do it exceptionally well. I do it so it feels like hell. 
I do it so it feels real. I guess you could say I've a call. The Beekeeper's Daughter A garden of mouthings Purple, scarlet, speckled, black The great corollas dilate Peeling back their silks Their musk encroaches Circle after circle A well of scents Almost too dense to breathe in Hieratical in your frock coat Maestro of the bees You move among the many-breasted hives my heart under your foot, sister of a stone. In burrows narrow as a finger, solitary bees keep house among the grasses. Kneeling down, I set my eye to a whole mouth and meet an eye, round, green, disconsolate as a tear. Father, bridegroom, in this Easter egg under the coronal of sugar roses, the queen bee marries the winter of your year. The Colossus I shall never get you put together entirely, pieced, glued, and properly jointed. Mule bray, pig grunt, and body cackles proceed from your great lips. It's worse than a barnyard. Perhaps you consider yourself an oracle, mouthpiece of the dead, or of some god or other. Thirty years now I have labored to dredge the silt from your throat. I am none the wiser. A blue sky out of the Oristia arches above us. O oh, Father, all by yourself you are pithy and historical as the Roman Forum. It would take more than a lightning stroke to create such a ruin. Nights, I squat in the cornucopia of your left ear out of the wind, counting the red stars and those of plum color. The moon and the yew tree. This is the light of the mind, cold and planetary. The trees of the mind are black. The light is blue. The grasses unload their griefs on my feet as if I were God, prickling my ankles and murmuring of their humility. Fumy, spiritous mists inhabit this place, separated from my house by a row of headstones. I simply cannot see where there is to get to. The moon is no door. It is a face in its own right, white as a knuckle and terribly upset. It drags the sea after it like a dark crime. It is quiet with the ogape of complete despair. I live here. Twice on Sunday, the bells startle the sky. Eight great tongues affirming the resurrection. At the end, they soberly bong out their names. The yew tree points up. It has a gothic shape. The eyes lift after it and find the moon. The moon is my mother. She is not sweet like Mary. Her blue garments unloose small bats and owls. How I would like to believe in tenderness. The face of the effigy, gentled by candles, bending on me in particular, its mild eyes. I have fallen a long way. Clouds are flowering blue and mystical over the face of the stars. Inside the church, the saints will be all blue, floating on their delicate feet over the cold pews, their hands and faces stiff with holiness. The moon sees nothing of this. She is bald and wild, and the message of the yew tree is blackness, blackness and silence. Ariel 
stasis in darkness. Then the substanceless blue pour of tor and distances. God's lioness, how one we grow. Pivot of heels and knees. The furrow splits and passes. Sister to the brown arc of the neck I cannot catch. Nigger eye berries casting dark hooks. Black sweet blood mouthfuls. Shadows. Something else hauls me through air, thighs, hair, flakes from my heels. White Godiva iron peel, dead hands, dead stringencies. And now I foam to wheat, the glitter of seas. The child's cry melts in the wall. And I am the arrow, the dew that flies, suicidal at one with the drive, into the red eye, the cauldron of morning. Daddy, you do not do, you do not do any more black shoe in which I have lived like a foot for thirty years, poor and white, barely daring to breathe or hurt chew. Daddy, I have had to kill you. You died before I had time, marble heavy, a bag full of God, ghastly statue with one gray toe big as a Frisco seal. Not God, but a swastika, so black no sky could squeak through. Every woman adores a fascist, the boot in the face, the brute, brute heart of a brute like you. You stand at the blackboard, Daddy, in the picture I have of you, a cleft in your chin instead of your foot. But no less a devil for that, no, not any less the black man who bit my pretty red heart in two. I was ten when they buried you. At twenty, I tried to die and get back, back, back to you. I thought even the bones would do. But they pulled me out of the sack and they stuck me together with glue. So, Daddy, I'm finally through. The black telephone's off at the root. The voices just can't worm through. There's a stake in your fat black heart and the villagers never liked you. They're dancing and stamping on you. They always knew it was you. Daddy, daddy, you bastard, I'm through. Edge. The woman is perfected. Her dead body wears the smile of accomplishment. The illusion of a Greek necessity flows in the scrolls of her toga. Her bare feet seem to be saying, We have come so far, it is over. Each dead child coiled a white serpent, one at each little pitcher of milk, now empty. She has folded them back into her body as petals of a rose close when the garden stiffens and odors bleed from the sweet, deep throats of the night flower. The moon has nothing to be sad about, staring from her hood of bone. She is used to this sort of thing. Her blacks crackle and drag. 